As I sit down to make this video, I respectfully acknowledge that I'm standing on the unceded traditional territory of the Comox First Nation, and I thank them for the use of their lands. Now, this is a follow-up video to one that I did yesterday where I was explaining how my verb, because that's what we call functions in J, uh, how my verb spiral works. And it was pretty complicated, and it showed a lot of things, but while I was doing that, I actually thought of a few things that I could to make it a little simpler and also a little quicker. So this follow-up is actually this new version of spiral. So let's first review what a spiral array is. Um, I'll go through this really quickly because I covered it yesterday, but I don't want you to have to walk through the whole video that I did yesterday as well. So spiral array starts with one in the center, and then the numbers increase to two, to three, to four in a spiral around one. And then once it gets to the, fills out that next ring, it starts in a new ring and starts all the way that spiral around until it gets to this ring and then it's out and it finishes up there. Now the challenge is that for every value that you see in this array, what we're trying to do is we're gonna develop a Cartesian index for that. And we're gonna call 0, 0 is the index of 1. So that's going to be our origin. So if you were, say for instance, looking for the index of 14, it would be 1, 2 over and 1 up. So it would be 2, 1 would be its, its coordinates. And similarly, if you went to 25, you'd be going minus 1, minus 2, 1, 2 up. So it would be minus 2, 2 would be the coordinates. And so we're trying to develop the coordinates for every value, or for any value is probably the best way to say it, that we are given. So if you give me a value, I'll tell you what the coordinates would be in a spiral array. So I developed a verb called spiral. And spiral is a verb, so of course it would work on a noun. So what do we give it, 29? Let's do 29. So spiral 29 is 1, 3. So starting from 1, we go over 1 and then up 3. 1, 2, 3. So it works. Oh, I'm so glad it works because when it doesn't work, it makes for a much more confusing video. Okay, so spiral is written in what's called um, an explicit format, which is a little easier to understand for people who aren't as familiar with uh, point-free and especially array languages. So this might be a little bit easier to follow. And this is what spiral looks like. This is the verb that actually will uh, create those coordinates. So going down line by line, and in the case of an explicit verb, it's line after line is how you read it. They, they just run down the lines until you get to this little parentheses, and that says that's the end of the verb. So 3 colon 0, all that does is it says this is a verb, and the zero actually says everything, every line after this is part of this verb until I have this final parenthesis. So that's all that zero means. So three tells me it's a verb, and the colon, which is a conjunction, as we're talking verbs, conjunctions are between nouns or verbs. In this case, it's between two nouns. Well, colon is a conjunction, and when it's used with two nouns, the zero means all these lines are what become the verb. That's a definition. The nb dot is just comments. So let's go through the comments because it sort of sets up how the verb works. So y, which in this case is 29, is the value I'm given of the verb spiral as an argument. That's fairly straightforward. s is the number of the ring that contains y. So in the case of y being 29, the ring we get is the first ring is here, the second ring is here, and the third ring is the one that contains 29. Okay, so we've got uh, S is the number of the ring that contains Y. T is the length of each side of the ring that contains Y. And so T, so when we're out in this third ring, T is going to be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. That's going to be the length of a side of the spiral array. So we're going to have 6 as t in this case, and d is the value distance from y to the upper left corner of that ring. So if it's 29, the distance I want to go to is 
all the way up to 49. So the difference between 49 and 29, which is 20, of course, is going to be my value for D. And then this select block calculates the index according to the side selected. So now we actually get into the part of the verb that's going to be doing things. And in the case of select, it's going to, this whole line here is going to evaluate to either 0, 1, 2, or 3. And depending on what evaluates to will be what it actually does. So let's see how it calculates the 0, 1, 2, and 3. And on the way to calculating the 0, 1, 2, and 3, it also creates the values for these variables. So starting with y, which we know is 29, this verb here is the square root. So I'm taking the square root of 29, which I know is going to be a little bit above 5. Not sure how much above 5, but until I got to 36, it wasn't going to get to 6. So say it's a little bit above 5. I'm going to uh, round it up, which is what this verb does. It just rounds up whatever I've got. So that would round it up from 5-something to 6. I'm going to take half of that, and so that gives me 3, and I'm going to round down. And that round down is just in case my half ended up with a half thing. I'm going to round down, and in this case, rounding 3 down is gives me 3. It's, it's an integer, so it just rounds down to itself. So let's take a look at and that, that, that is assigned, this, this equals dot is the assignment, or one of the assignment ways to do things in J, and this S is what it gets assigned to. So S, in this case, will be assigned 3. So what that's telling us is 3 is the ring number that the number 29 is on. Is it? Well, 1, 2, 3, and 29's right there. So it's on the third ring, and so... S is calculated as we'd expect. So now we have a value for S, which is the number of the ring that contains Y. Okay, now the next step is I'm going to double S this verb here. I keep working from my right to my left as I go through J. This verb here doubles whatever the value is to its, uh, to its right. And then I do an assignment to T. Well, S was 3, and if I double 3, I get 6, which is the length of a side. So that's that I, I'm, I'm building these variables. Okay, now this next step gets a little bit trickier because I'm uh, J's execution always goes right to left, except that you do if you if you want to change that execution up a little bit, you use parentheses, and then you do what's inside of parentheses before taking the next step. So we've got, this is the signal for divided by, um, and it's a percent sign, but it's actually what J uses is divided. And the easy way to think of it is you've got one dot above a slash and then a dot below a slash, and so J says that's divided. The slash itself is used for something else. It's actually an adverb. Uh, of course, we were talking about verbs, nouns, and conjunctions. Well, there are adverbs, too. They modify verbs. So uh, I know whatever it is, I'm going to divide, but it's going to be divided by t. But what is going to be divided by t? Well, I have to look at these parentheses. And so I've got a parentheses that, go, parentheses that goes right from here all the way over to here. But inside that, it's whatever I'm subtracting y from is in this parentheses. So let's start on the inner parentheses and work our way out. So we've got t, which we know is 6. And this is the uh, verb for increment. So I'm taking it from 6 up to 7, and then I'm squaring it to get 49. 49 is this value right up here. You notice something when you look at this uh, spiral array. You've got one at the center, and then you go to 9 here. Well, 9 is 2n plus 1 squared if n is the number of the ring. So in this ring, 9 is calculated because 2n plus 1 is 2 plus 1. 
and two plus one squared is three. And three squared, sorry, two plus one is three, and three squared is nine. So then you go up this one, and you've got n is two, so it's two n is four plus one is five, squared is 25. So each of these can be calculated really quickly just by knowing what ring it is. So that's where they sort of like an anchor point. If I know what those values are, I can calculate a lot of other things from that. So right now, I've figured out that wherever I am, in this case, I'm at 49, then I'm going to subtract y, which is the value I've got, which I think we had as 29. So it's going to be 49 minus 29, and that's going to be d, the distance from the upper left corner of that ring. So right now, I know d, I know t, I know s, and I know y. And those are actually all the um, variables that I need to know. I've got everything I need to know to do my calculation. The question is, which calculation do I do? So this brings us back. We're not finished yet because, of course, we got to the point here where we've got d, uh, which is 49, minus y, which is 29, which gives us 20. Now we're dividing it by t, which is 6. So we end up with 3 something, and we round down. So rounding down on this means that our answer it will become not 3 point something, it's going to be 3 on its own. So what we've decided now is we're doing case 3, which when you look at my comments over here, I've just done this so I can keep track of what's going on, it says this is what I do when I'm on the top side. And that actually makes perfect sense, and I'm going to show you why. When I, if I was case zero, that means that um, this value, this distance divided by t, will be less than one. Well, if you think about it, any of these numbers, the distance here, is less than the distance of this side. So if you divide by the length of the side, and you're in any of these numbers, you're going to get zero point something, and you round down, and you're going to be case 0. So nb is the left side. Until you get to 21, or, or sorry, we're on 49, until you get to 43, and then when you get to 43, what's going to happen is now that distance is going to be 6. It's going to be divided by 6, which is the length. You're going to be at 1, and you will be at 1 all the way until you get to 37. And then the distance will be 12, and it'll be divided by the length, which is 6, and you'll be at 2s. And you'll be at 2s all the way to here until you go to 3s, and then you'll be 3s all the way to here. So that's where this select comes from. It's actually choosing which side you're on. And the reason it does that is depending on which side you're on depends what you're going to do with the coordinates uh, relative to the nearest corner. And something about the corners is really interesting when you think about it. Each one of these corners on this way is of the form minus 1, 1. So it'll be a multiple of minus 1, 1. So in the case of 9, it'll be minus 1, 1. In 25, it'll be minus 2, minus, uh, sorry, minus 2, 2. 49, it'll be minus 3, 3, and so on. Now, that's on this diagonal going up, going down. All of these positions are going to be uh, 1 minus 1, and then 2 minus 2, and 3 minus 3, so on. Going this way, this 7 is always going to be minus 1 minus 1 format. The 3 is always going to be plus 1 plus 1. And 13 would be plus 2, plus 2. That'll be the coordinates. So you can know right away on each of these corners exactly what the form of the coordinates are. All you need to know to get the actual coordinates is to know what ring you're in. And we already know that. That's what S is. So now we're going to do our calculations. So in case 3, we've got T is 6. And we're going to multiply by that by 3, and we're going to subtract that from d, which is the distance. And you think, where did that come from? Well, think about it for a second. 
if I want to go relative to the nearest corner and my distance is actually the distance all the way back to 49, I don't want to be uh, adjusting my, my uh, index based on where 49 is. I want to do it based on where 31 is. And in order to get to 31 and not 49, I'm going to get rid of these and these and these. So that's 3 times t that I'm just going to get rid of. And then I'm going to multiply that by 1, 0. And why? Why 1, 0? Because when I'm on the top, the only movement I want is along the x-axis. So I'm going to do it relative to 31. I had 29. And d was 20. I'm subtract subtracting 3 times t, which is 18 gives me 2, so I'm subtracting 2, 0. What am I subtracting it from? I'm subtracting it from S, which tells me what ring I'm on, times 1, 1, which is this corner. And so S is 3, so I've got 3, 3, minus 2, 0, and I end up with 1, 3. And that's how I get that answer. So instead of having to calculate all these coordinates in a, in a spiral uh, matrix, um, I can actually, and I've actually sort of put off doing all my calculations right up to the point where I need them. I haven't even calculated these positions, like the corner positions, until I'm actually in here. All I've done is I know how far I am away from the top corner here, but then based on what's selected, I can choose how, f how many of these sides I ignore before I make my move. And then, of course, these different numbers here correspond to if I'm on the bottom side, I'm moving along the x-axis. If I'm on the top side, I'm moving along the x-axis. That's why those are one zeros. Right side and left side, I'm moving along the y-axis, so that's zero ones. And whether or not it's a minus or a plus depends on whether I'm having to move up to get to my number or down to get to my number if I'm on the y right axis or right to left if I'm moving on the x-axis. So this is the entire uh, verb, the entire function for determining the coordinates or the, of the different values in a, in a spiral array. Now the thing is, I'll just uh, do something that is a way to measure stuff in J. And what it's called is time space x. And what it does is it actually returns the time it takes to uh, uh, complete a function and also the space that it uses. So I will use spiral. And let's do, oh, we said 29, didn't we? So let's just stay with 29. There we go. So this is going to do time space x a thousand times. And when it's finished that thousand times, it'll come back and tell me how much each time averaged out to and how much space it used. So this took about 1.336 milliseconds. It's pretty quick. It only used 2.5k. These are bytes, so 2,400, almost 2,500 bytes. And that's the amount of space it used. Now, in my older version, because I've, I've kept that around, I called it spiral one. Isn't that clever? Now look what happens when I go spiral one. My old version was roughly four times more. So it's, it's 4.8 milliseconds, uh, microseconds, 4.8 millionths of a second. That's uh, 10 to the minus six. But look how much space it used to do it. And the reason was is because I was calculating all of the diagonal values in that case. I wasn't even calculating all of the values. I was only calculating diagonal values and working from there. But then I realized I didn't have to do that. I just have to find out what ring I was on. And then once I'm on the ring, I can go relative to the corners. And it saves up a lot of time. Where you really see it, if I use a really big number, uh, let's do... Oh, 404, oh, oh. So 
what that's telling me <laughs> is I'm using, <laughs> and this is, even though I'm doing this a thousand times and averaging it, there is a little bit of play in this. So it's actually telling me that was faster um, than the first time where I was doing Spiral 29, even though I'm using a much bigger number. Um, but it, And it did take a bit more space. Well, it would take a bit more space because the calculations are with slightly bigger numbers. But now is where the real eye-opener comes. And with Jay Aglaffin, all these are really quick. But this is 1.96 times 10 to the minus 5. So this is actually like 19 times slower than this one. And look how much space it used. Um, it used almost 22K, whereas this one is just under 3K. So you can see that there's a lot of efficiency built into J. And, uh, and depending on how you, as I said, my older version, is it's still J, and it's still fairly quick, but I wasn't making full use of the of the uh, problem space as it was, as it were. Uh, I had an old math professor who used to say the, the, the best way to come up with a good solution to something is get rid of everything that's not the solution and what you're left with is a solution. Well, when I was thinking about this, I figured out all the things that I really needed to know and that's all I worked with. So uh, thanks for spending the time listening to this and I hope this was useful. And I think it was even seeing this different, this more explicit version of J, it becomes a little easier for traditional programmers uh, to understand compared to uh, some of the tacit stuff, which I find fascinating and I really enjoy because it's so functional and it's so, you, you're just manipulating and it's almost like writing poetry. It's just, it's, it's, I, I really enjoy it. But certainly, uh, there's nothing wrong with this format and it's very quick. Um, and for people who are used to reading programs this way, it's a little easier. So I hope that helps as well. Uh, J isn't anything to be scared of. It's, uh, it's kind of new. It's kind of exciting. And, uh, and if you get a chance to play with it, I, I, would, uh, I would advise it. I think it's a good idea to, uh, to widen your scope of programming languages by playing with this one. Thanks for listening.